Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to Basic Gospel. With Bob Christopher, I'm Bob Davis, and we're glad you're with us today as we continue in our teaching series of Bob Christopher's Top 10 Favorite Passages. This is a study session, of course, and uh, no live phone calls are available today, but you can still get a voicemail to uh, to us with your questions now or anytime, as a matter of fact, at 844-322-2742. That's our kind of our universal number around here, 844-322-2742. Or if you prefer, you can send an email to bob at basicgospel.net, and that will accomplish the same purpose. Either way, we'll be glad to hear from you and promise to get an answer to you uh, on the air as soon as possible. But for right now, let's get today's broadcast underway as Bob Christopher's top 10 favorite passage number seven is the subject today and here is Bob Christopher. Well top 10 passage number seven is Philippians 3. We're going to do the whole chapter. Uh, I tried to condense it and just take a section out of it but you just really can't. It's yeah. just it's just a dynamite chapter. It's and rich. A good, yeah a good friend of mine years ago uh, used to say and he still says it today that all roads in the Bible lead to Philippians 3. And as I read through it, I think Philippians 3 is really a master explanation of a passage, a single verse in John chapter 17, 17, verse 3, where Jesus said, and this is eternal life, that you know God the Father and the one whom he sent. Yeah. So it gives a definition of what eternal life is. And it's not longevity. It gives a quality of life that we experience through relationship, through getting to know God the Father, through getting to know Jesus Christ the Son, that's what eternal life is all about. That's the substance. That is the essence. And here in this particular chapter, Philippians 3, Paul puts some real flesh and blood to that, shows us what it means to really know uh, Jesus Christ. So let's just dive in. And I think this is going to be a fascinating study. So I've divided this into four sections, I believe. Yes, four sections. And uh, we're going to move through this as quickly as we can because we have a clock. We do have a clock. going to stop us at some point. (laughs) So this first section is verses 1 through 6. And it says this, Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. This whole book of Philippians is a book of joy. It's talking about be joyful, uh, rejoice in the Lord in all things. It doesn't matter the circumstances that you're in. Rejoice because you know Jesus Christ. Rejoice because you have the love of the Father. Rejoice because you have the fellowship of God's Spirit. Rejoice for all of these things that you have in Jesus Christ. So this is a book of joy. And Paul uh, knew what it meant to experience joy in the darkest times. I mean, I think he wrote this from prison. Mm -hmm. So he's bound up in prison and yet he's saying rejoice. Why? Because he knew what it meant to rejoice in the Lord. And he says this, it is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again. And it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. Though, uh, though my, I myself have reasons for such confidence, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. So that's the first section. So it starts out on a very positive note, rejoice in the Lord. Now, Paul says, it's no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. We need to be really deep in the essentials of the Christian faith. We really need to know who Jesus is. We need to know what he accomplished for us through his death and burial and resurrection. And so Paul, in every single letter he wrote, he spent an inordinate amount of time just going back over those essentials talking about what Christ accomplished for us, talking about who Christ is. We see this in this book of Philippians. He gives us some information about who Jesus is, about how he humbled himself and became obedient to even to the point of death. Uh, And he did that for the joy 
set before him. So he he writes this stuff every time he picks up his pen. Why? Because it's important for us to know these essential truths. Why? It's these essential truths that safeguard us against error, against lies, and against deceit uh, from religious and worldly sources. I mean, we have all kinds of messages coming at us, uh, and the same was true of those folks back then. They had all kinds of messages being thrown at them, and very persuasive people saying, believe this, or you need to do this, or you need to do that in order to be a real Christian, or you need to do that to gain happiness and joy and all of those sort of things. And if they didn't understand the truth, if they didn't know the essentials of the Christian faith, they could be easily swayed to believe those lies, to believe that error, to uh, give in to the deceit. Mm -hmm. And so Paul was saying, Hey, these truths, these these basics, these essentials, they're the very things that are going to safeguard you against those errors, those lies, that deceit that comes from religious and worldly sources. And then he says this, for it is we who are the circumcision. So um, circumcision is not something uh, from God's vantage point that was physical, although there was the physical circumcision that the Jewish people did. Um, But that was something that was pointing to a circumcision of the heart. So every true believer has experienced that spiritual circumcision. That's what, that's what makes you a true believer. And with that, God has sent his spirit to take up residence in you. And there's a fusion. You are now in union with Jesus Christ through the spirit. And so if that's happened, if you've experienced this circumcision of the heart, then here's some things that are going to be true of you. You're going to serve God by his spirit or worship God by his spirit. Jesus said to the woman at the well, uh, you must worship God in spirit and in truth. So if you've had that circumcision of the heart, then you're going to worship God uh, by his spirit. You're going to boast In the Lord Jesus, you know you've been saved, not by anything you've done, but by grace through faith. It was a gift of God. So you're going to boast in the person of Jesus Christ. You're going to boast in the finished work that he did on your behalf. And that's what it means to worship in the Spirit, to serve in the Spirit, um, is to walk in dependence upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Spirit of God is going to take all the things of the Lord Jesus and make them known to us. And he says, and we put no confidence in the flesh. Now, these are the three characteristics, the three marks of a true believer, one who has been circumcised in the heart. Now, Paul talked about that in Romans 2.29. He says, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the Spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. So if you've experienced new birth, you've experienced this spiritual circumcision, which makes you serve God by a spirit who compels you to boast in the Lord Jesus Christ and who who brings that stark reality that apart from Christ, you can do nothing. So there is no boasting in the flesh. Now, Paul said, if you want to boast, now put your resume up against mine, yeah. and I'm going to beat you every single time. And he he spells out his fleshly resume, that he was circumcised on the eighth day. He was of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. Yeah. But he's going to say in this next section, and we'll get to that in just a few minutes, um, that all of that was was dung was uh, I'm trading all that in for something more spectacular mm-hmm. and that's what this next section is all about nothing we've done but everything that he has done Philippians 3 it's session 7 of Bob Christopher's top 10 favorite passages here on basic gospel and we're pausing for just a moment friends to remind you that we need your help to continue broadcasting and streaming this good news of Jesus Christ every day on the airwaves so please help us if you can uh, help this uh, keep this message going 
Click donate at basicgospel.net to help with your gift today. Again, that's basicgospel.net. Also, if you'd like to revisit any of our Friday sessions, you'll find them all at basicgospel.net slash teaching. All of the teaching seri- uh, sessions are there. So again, uh, access, to access that anytime at basicgospel.net slash teaching. But right now, back to Philippians 3, session 7 on Bob Christopher's list of top 10 favorite passages. So we're going to start with verse 7. So Paul get, had given his fleshly resume and and said, hey, if you're going to boast, uh, if if you don't have a resume like mine, then forget about it. Yeah. Um, but he's going to say, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. He said, I'm trading all of that in. I'm putting that behind me. Why? Because I've got, I've got something better in Jesus Christ. So whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them garbage or dung that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. And I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. So Paul's fleshly resume doesn't compare to what he had in Christ Jesus. And ours doesn't either. Anything that we've gained through this world, any position, any status, any power, any prestige, any financial rewards, Mm -hmm. none of that compares to knowing Christ Jesus. And that's why uh, my friend said all passages, all roads lead to Philippians 3 because this is the pinnacle. This is what eternal life is all about. It's about knowing Christ. Christ Jesus. It's about knowing every aspect of who he is. And so when you come to Christ, when you receive salvation, when you're saved, you know, we we get all excited about the fact that our sins have been forgiven. We get all excited about the fact that we have a new identity. And those are wonderful gifts of grace. But what we've gained is Jesus. He is God's gift to us. He is what we receive. He comes to live inside of us, and now his life is our life. So we've gained Christ, and we're standing in his righteousness. Um, We've received his righteousness. It's not a righteousness that's based on law that comes to us through obedience to the law, but it comes to us on the basis of of faith. So we've gained this knowledge of Christ, not just knowledge about him, but an experiential knowledge of Jesus, a personal relationship. We're resting in the righteousness of God. And now this compels us when we know that we're right with God, when we know that we have access into his presence, when we know that he's for us, not against us. And that's what this gift of righteousness tells us, that God is for us, not against us. Well, this compels us to know him in all aspects of who he is. So under the law, no one drew near to God. Everybody was afraid. They didn't want to know about God. Why? Because they thought if they they found out more, it would be all about judgment and condemnation Mm -hmm. and all of those sort of things. But that's not the truth about God. God is love. And Jesus Christ giving us his righteousness compels us to get to know him for who he really is. And so Paul lays out some things. He says, I want to know the power of Christ's resurrection. I want that power to course through my spiritual veins and be be the power that moves me through this world today, that moves th- me through all the circumstances of life. He says, I want to participate in the sufferings of Christ so that I can become like him in his death. Well, what in the world does that mean? Well, Paul has already explained that in chapter 2 and the fact that that Jesus humbled himself, although he was in 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 um, the likeness of God, he didn't hold on to that, but he 
emptied himself, he humbled himself, and became obedient, even obedient to death. Mm-hmm. That's the type of suffering that Paul is talking about here, this self-emptying uh, so others can benefit. Uh, it's about loving people in such a way that you're willing to endure uh, pain and rejection and all of those things so that they can know the love of Jesus Christ, so that they can be connected uh, to God through faith in Jesus. So Paul said, I want to know that. I want to know what that love feels like, not just um, in word, but I want to know it experientially sure. so that I can become like him in his death and somehow to attain And this word attain means to arrive at as of a goal, to reach a goal, um, to the resurrection from the dead. Now, this word resurrection, this is the only place in the New Testament that this particular word is used. Um, Other words are used uh, when it's talked about in 1 Corinthians 15, for example. But this is the only place this particular use of this word uh, occurs. And what it's talking about is the fact that we've been raised to walk in the newness of life, that Paul is saying, I I have come from death, I've been made alive, and I want that life to be uh, expressed through me out there in this world Mm -hmm. um, as as one who has been raised from the dead. And so that was Paul's goal. The goal is for the life of Jesus to permeate our lives, every aspect of it. And it's going to happen as we grow in our knowledge of him, our understanding of the power of the resurrection, and participating in his sufferings. It's basic gospel, everybody, and this is uh, Bob Christopher's Top Ten. Philippians 3 is the subject today. Glad you're with us. And you know, friends, the truth of being reminded of God's love and grace can help you start every day with hope, and the incomparable joy of knowing that you are a child of God. And we think one of the very best ways for that to happen is by opening your email box first thing every morning and finding the Basic Gospel Daily Devotional. Start each day with the sure knowledge that you are a dearly loved child of God. The devotional is free, and you can start your subscription right now, as a matter of fact, at basicgospel.net slash subscribe. We hope you'll subscribe today. Again, basicgospel.net slash subscribe. Now back to Bob Christopher's favorite passage is in number, this is number seven. Number seven, Mm -hmm. Philippians chapter three. So down to verse 12, not that I've already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. So we're growing in grace. We're growing in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the process. Uh, And as, as that happens, we're going to see more and more of his life being manifested in and through us. Uh, So that's the goal for the life of Jesus to permeate every area of our lives. And Paul is saying, hey, I'm still in process just like everyone else has, but I press on. I want to press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Now, why did Christ Jesus take hold of you? Why did Christ Jesus take hold of me? So that we might have life and have it to the full. Mm -hmm. So Paul is saying, I want to press on to take hold of that. I want to experience that abundant life in as full a way as I possibly can through faith in my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, He says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind. Now, what was behind for for Paul? Well, his fleshly resume, Mm -hmm. uh, that that zeal, that um, faultlessness as far as obedience to the law, that being a Pharisee, being a Hebrew of Hebrews. He's he's traded all of that in. That Paul has died, and he has raised. He has been raised in Christ to walk in the newness of life with a brand new identity, and so he's forgetting what what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. He says, "I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus." What's the prize? Knowing Christ in His fullness. Yeah. That is the prize. That is the goal, knowing Jesus. So what Paul is saying to us here is that we need to keep recognizing that Christ is the goal. 
a lot of times we want Christ to come alongside of us to help us achieve financial reward, to help us achieve uh, a good mental state or emotional well-being and all of those sort of things. So we have those goals, and we want Christ to come alongside to help us get to those goals. Mm -hmm. But what Paul is saying here is, no, 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 Christ is the goal. He's the one. And we've already gained him. We've already received him. And now our life is getting to know him. That's what eternal life is all about. So he has taken hold of us so that we could take hold of his life. So we need to forget about the past. We need to forget about all those things that were once so important to us and press on toward this goal. Now, Paul kind of talked about this in Colossians uh, 3, 1 through 3, when he said, if you've been raised in Christ, then set your mind on things above, not on things mm -hmm. below. And, and he talks about the fact that when Christ appears, um, we're going to appear with him and that we, uh, that he is our very life. Yeah. So this is kind of a recounting of what he's, what he's written to, um, the, the Colossians in that little section, Colossians 3, 1 through 3. So he goes on and says, all of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. So we should realize that we're all looking for the same goal, the goal of knowing Christ Jesus. Why? Because that's what eternal life is. Now, if on some point you think differently, uh, that too God will make clear to you. If you think differently about the goal of the Christian life, then God is going to make it clear to you that the goal is trusting him and getting to know him. Mm -hmm. He's yeah. going to make that abundantly clear. So only let us live up to what we have already attained. We've already been given this life. So let's enjoy it to the full. Mm -hmm. That's what he's saying here. So join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. How did Paul live? Uh, by faith in Jesus Christ. He lived by grace through faith in Jesus. How are we to live? By grace through faith in Jesus. That's how we experience the abundant life. That's how we grow in grace. That's how we grow in our knowledge of Jesus Christ. For as I've often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. And their glory is in their shame, and their mind is set on earthly things. So you're going to encounter a lot of these enemies of the cross, and they're going to try to trip you up. They're going to try to move you away from the goal of knowing Christ Jesus. Be aware, stand firm. And here's what Paul gives as a defense. He says, their minds are set on earthly things, but your citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly body so that they will be like his glorious body. So we have this life that we're experiencing here and now, mm -hmm. that this, this out-resurrection, so to speak, that we can show forth to the world today. And then we have this marvelous hope that one day when we're absent from the body, present with the Lord, that we're going to get brand new bodies that are going to be exactly like Jesus's. And it's going to happen through the power that enables the Lord Jesus Christ to bring everything under his control. Yes. So, folks, you've been given new life in Jesus. Take hold of it. Press on to know him. That's what the Christian life is is all about. Absolutely. Bob, wonderful. Thank you for the, all of those thoughts. Uh, it's just really good stuff, as I always like to <laughs> yes, say. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Well, friends, thanks for being with us today for Session 7 in our study uh, based on Philippians 3, Bob Christopher's top 10 favorite passages, of course, and we'll do it with number 8 again next week. But in the meantime, if you have a question about anything you've heard on Basic Gospel, or in general for that matter, the phone line is always open for you at 844-322-2742. Again, 844-322-2742. We love hearing from you, and we'll be glad to address your question on Basic Gospel. Again, that number, 844-322-2742. Please remember also, we need your support to keep the good news coming. You can donate now or anytime at basicgospel.net. 
Well, for that Bob and this Bob and all the ministry staff, I'm Bob Davis, and uh, we hope you'll be with us again on Monday after a great weekend of the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll see you then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.